Welcome to the Sociology of the Sweet Science. My name is Patrick Devitt, and I am joined with Mr. Jacob Stitch Duran. How are you today, Mr. Duran? I'm doing good, Patrick. So in a recent interview with GQ, they asked, what's a cut man? And he provided the perfect answer. He's someone who gives you another round. And I wanted to ask, how did you get started as a cut man? Yeah, you know, I have a great history of following your dreams, right? So I grew up in the Central Valley of California as a farm worker, as a migrant worker. That's what I did all my life till um, I joined the Air Force in 1972. And uh, that was during the Bruce Lee era. So I always told myself if I went to the Orient, I'd want to study the martial arts. Well, it turns out that uh, they sent me to Thailand. And being a young kid, I didn't know much about Thailand. It was during the Vietnam War. and uh, But I got there and I saw my first Muay Thai fight. and. Uh, that whole year, I dedicated myself to it and got back to the States and uh, got into boxing to improve my hands and open up a school of kickboxing. And so I was a trainer before I was a cut man. And I did the whole gambit of managing fighters and promoting fights and all that. But being a cut man kind of floated to the top. So uh, 27 years ago, I made the move to Las Vegas, my wife and I, and uh, to follow my dreams to be a cut man. And uh, the UFC came around then at that time, it was only boxing. And then uh, I knew Dana White before the UFC, and he brought me in as a cut man. And uh, from there, I went forward, and uh, here I am talking to you. Did you know Dana from um, when he was in Boston? I no, I knew Dana here in Las Vegas. Okay. Uh, you know, for many, many years, I knew him. And and uh, he's the one, when they bought the UFC, uh, I was doing a, a K-1, a kickboxing show at the Bellagio, and he's in the audience. and. Uh, he asked for my card, and the next day he called me and uh, said that him and Lorenzo and Frank Portita bought the UFC, and they want to know if I would be interested in being a house cut man. And at that time, there was no program for house cut men. So uh, Leon Tabs, the original cut man from UFC number one, uh, Burt Watson, the coordinator, and myself, we put that program together uh, that we used and they continue to use. And now it's used uh, worldwide, and even in boxing. So, you know, we're there to give that fighter that one more round. When you were um, hired by the UFC, were you allowed to still work in boxing, or was there a non-compete clause? No, there was. Uh, we were independent contractors, as they, as they said, right? But they, they kind of held us. We couldn't do any other MMA shows. Uh, I could still do boxing. Uh, and I actually, I did uh, the PFL. Uh, when they did their first show in Las Vegas, I did their show and and they put me in Don House on like a five day re fight restriction. And they basically said that we're independent contractors and and uh, that, you know, you gave these guys credibility. So at that point, it was uh, very selective. Um, when we spoke last week, you mentioned that you're headed to Japan tomorrow. Is it safe to assume it's for a fight and not vacation? Yeah, it's for boxing. And, and you know, it's funny, I just left my optometrist and I told him that in Japan, I've been there countless times for New Year's Eve, right? Uh, but they have a big K-1 kickboxing show, uh, big uh, MMA, which used to be Pride, now it's rising. Uh, and then they have a big boxing show. So I've been in all three of them. And this one, I'm working with Kazuto Ayoka, the world champion out of uh, Japan. But uh, the way I understand it is during that night, the people that are watching TV, 80% of them are tuned into one of the three. So it's, it's a big, big things in Japan. And, you know, I'm always glad to be part of it. Since you work all across the world, what other organizations and combat sports have you been um, involved in? All of them, <laughs> pretty much. Yeah, if they're, if they're big time, you know, they've pretty much called me. Uh, you know, but sometimes, I mean, in a situation like this, I work with a promotion where we represent... Uh, all the fighters, or I work as a freelancer. And that's what I'm doing in Japan. I'm working solely for one fighter. So yeah, I've, just, I've done them all. Um, and when you say you are working solely for one fighter, um, did they come to you, the the fighters? Yes. Yeah. And how did yeah, how was that negotiated? Yeah, I've worked with uh, Kazuto before Ayoka. So you know, there's a base price that I have for everything, of course, as 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 you know and. And I'll give him my base price. And then depending on the progress of his career and my career with him, 
then the economics go up uh, as as he makes more money than I make more money. Uh, I'm basically like an insurance policy. So if you go from a Volkswagen to a Ferrari, your insurance is going to be a little bit different, right? Uh, so in doing that, I am that insurance policy. And is it still possible to be a fighter and not have a cut man in the same way that Mike Tyson would also, or, you know, had early in his career. I remember the Buster Douglas fight. They put a latex glove with uh, ice water as the cold compress in it. I feel like that wouldn't be allowed anymore. And that's probably the stupidest thing you could ever do. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, that's my education. And, and when you asked to do this interview, that's why I came forward because my job as my legacy will be will to, that I educated. And, and keep in mind now, in combat sports, boxing, MMA, kickboxing, none of us have to be certified to be called professionals. All you need is a license, which for the most part is like 50 bucks and, and you're considered a professional. But I see so many things gone wrong and going wrong even now uh, in the sports uh, that I try to educate them as much as possible. Keep in mind, I come from a martial arts background, which is Muay Thai, and our job is to teach. And uh, boxing is not like that. As, as years before, I mean, I've been here 27 years, 28, maybe 29 years ago, I went to a boxing show in Richmond, California. And this guy was doing a nice job as on the cut, and I was making that transition. And I went and asked him if, uh, if he could tell me what he did, because I was trying to be a cut man. And basically, he looks at me and says, fuck you, I'm taking this to my grave, and you got to learn like me, and he walked away. Uh, so at that point, I knew I was going to be like him. And I've done this interview hundreds of times with Patrick, but I've never mentioned his name because that's not important. Just that the ethics that he gave me, that he just uh, he just verified that this is the way I'm supposed to be. Now I go back with Andre Ward, that was the undisputed world champ, and back to Oakland, and and he forgot about it. Now him and his son, I want to take a picture with me now that my credibility went up, mm -hmm. and, and I did, and I thought, well, I got you. So I never want to be like him. Well. As the great educator you are, you also happen to pop up occasionally in certain movies. We have the Creed films, Rocky Balboa. I think you're even in Ocean's Eleven when Lennox Lewis is going in the ring. Um, yeah. Now, is that something that filmmakers will approach you um, to appear in, or do you just have a great manager? No, I manage myself. Mm -hmm. You know, no one. But uh, to this point. Uh, one of the proudest things of my whole career to this point, Patrick, is that I've never asked for a job. To this day, I have never asked for one job. I had a chance of working with Floyd Mayweather, but circumcised, he wanted to, yeah, I don't kiss ass, <laughs> right? And uh, But yeah, they um, they called me for the movies, you know, which was kind of just out of the blue. And I've been, and I did Play to the Bone with Woody Harrelson and Antonio Banderas. I did uh, Here Comes the Boom with Kevin James, Selma Hayek, and Winkler. I just got a residual check uh, yesterday. I put it in the bank today. Uh, I did Ocean's Eleven with Vladimir Klitschko when he fought Lennox Lewis when they robbed the casino. Yes. Uh, and after that movie, I worked with Vladimir Klitschko for eight years. And uh, so that was good. And then, of course, I did Balboa when Rocky fought his last fight, uh, which was great. And then I did Creed 1, 2, and 3. And Creed 3 comes out 3, 3 23. So I've been blessed, bro. You know, it just it had to happen to somebody. I, I just happen to be that guy that it's, it's happening to. And uh, but I try to represent uh, the sport as as high level as I can. And you know, as you just mentioned, you worked closely with the Klitschkos for about eight years. Um, yeah. Can you comment on their commitment to fighting for their country's independence and all of the work that they've been doing for Ukraine? Yeah, I tell you, it uh, it gave me chills. You just even asked me that question. Uh, but it's it's really ironic uh, that you say that, that you ask that question, because very few people know that they've gone beyond the call of duty, and they're literally in the trenches. It's Zelensky, and Vitaly Klitschko is the mayor of Kiev, and then Vladimir is kind of like the face, the spokesperson for, for the country, right? And uh, yeah, you know, I send them my condolences, my, you know, my so-and-so and all that, but I don't want to bug them because I know they're in the trenches. But is, speaking of the Creed movie, Michael B. Jordan would come to me as an advisor and I would always give him authenticity, right? So he asked who should give away the WBC belt in the movie. And I explained to him that it was created by Jose Suleiman, uh, was the president of the WBC from Mexico City. Uh, he passed away 
His son, Mauricio, now carries the, the, the trademark of the WBC, the most prestigious belt out there. So, of course, we used uh, we picked the guy from one of the extras from the audience that represented Mexico, and he gave the belt away, so he got a free plug. I helped him get that, right? But going fast forward, I'm doing a show in Dallas when Earl Spence is fighting Ugas, and Mauricio is there, and I tell him the story. And he says, because both Vladimir and Vitaly were WBC champions, he says, let's send him a picture, and uh, I'm going to let you listen to what Vladimir sent me, all right? This was uh, uh, kind of, well, I'll let you listen to what he said, and then you'll find out the kind of relationship that I have with these guys, all right? So this is Vladimir Klitschko. Uh, let me see here. Give me a second. No worries. Two third men on a specialist stage with whom I spent so much time talking, and he actually saved my career on a lot of different stages. Uh, if Stitch wouldn't be in my corner, I would not make the record of 12 years being a champion. So um, that's uh, so great to see you both, and Stitch is. The man. That's beautiful. So you got to hear it firsthand, bro. Oh wow! And um, that was earlier this year, right? Probably April. Yes. Wow. That's yeah, awesome. yeah, yeah. So, yeah, you know, uh, that's I always had a great relationship with him, and I'll give you a little behind the scenes story with uh, my last fight with him. Is uh, well, in in the first fight I worked with him. Let's go from back one. If, if we got the time. Is he ended up with a cut up here? kind of like the one Forrest Griffith had in the UFC, right? When he fought Shogun. And I've worked on those cuts many times, but I know that they bleed. And at that time, you have to understand me as a cut man, not only understand the cuts, but uh, the understanding of the, of the scorecards. So he had just come back from losing his world title to Lehman Brewster's his first, first fight back. And he won the first three rounds. He got dropped in the fourth round. And then on the fifth round, he gets that headbutt, which is an unintentional headbutt. So knowing that he was winning the fight and he didn't look all that good and he had a, a serious cut, I told him and Vitaly as they sat down that, look, you're winning the fight, you have a bad cut, and let the doctor stop the fight. So when the doctor came in, she says, and I've worked with her many, many times in the UFC and all that, so she knows my caliber of work. And I was Stitch, what do you think? So I go like this, and I open the cut up, and I said, yeah, it's pretty bad. So she stopped the fight, went to the scorecards. He ended up winning the fight and became world champion. All right. So that was my initial. Uh, well, first going way back, I met him in 1991 when the Soviet Union first broke. We took a team of professional boxers and kickboxers to Kiev. And at that time, Vitaly and Vladimir, they were young, but they were stars. So I met them the first time, then Ocean's Eleven, then working this. But then my final fight with them uh, against Anthony Joshua was in Wembley Stadium and 90,000 people, right? So I get there Thursday night because my daughter Carla had just gotten married Wednesday in, in Crete, so I flew in. So I didn't see him until Friday at the weigh-ins. But I'm talking to him and, and Vitaly, and we're going over the things. And finally, at the end, I put my hand on Vladimir. I said, look, don't worry about nothing tomorrow. I'm going to take care of you like you're my son. And I leave because I know in the nights before they can't sleep. Well, here I am, Patrick. I'm putting the final Vaseline on Vladimir before Michael Buffer does the announcements. There's 90,000 people looking at us. And between him and I, we're about this far apart. He says, you can call me son. Bro, that kind of made everything for me. And yeah, it touched me. It gave me chills just like that. And and he calls me, you know, after the fights and, hey, daddy. you know. So we didn't get too much into it. But then I saw him much later in Germany. And I said, Vladimir, at that moment, why? Simple as that. He says, Stitch, there's very few people I trust in my life. You are one of them. So that's the relationship I have with the brothers. That's incredible. That is such yeah. an incredible story. And uh, going back to the first fight, I remember uh, I, I saw in an, an, an interview that you did that you said the judge from the first fight uh, that you worked with uh, the coach coast came up to you and said, did you do what I think you? Uh, <laughs> I saw you do? And... Uh, he says that was brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Oh, that, that was a that was Jay Nady, the the referee for the fight, right? And a couple of months later, we're doing a show at Caesars, and we're at the weigh-ins, and he comes up to me, he says, "Stitch, come here." 
did you do what I thought you did with Vladimir? Did you open up that cut in front of the doctor? I said, I did. He goes, that was brilliant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that's, you know, that's the thing is understanding the whole, the whole game and, and, and taking advantage of these opportunities. And like I say, my job is to give that fighter that one more round. And I gave Vladimir that one more round and through the scorecards. And so, yeah. So that was a good compliment. When you are in the corner, um, when a round is going on, I'm sure you are looking out for certain things uh, throughout the fight and keeping an eye on certain injuries. Um, when you're watching a fight, let's just say for entertainment's sake at home, are there differences in how you watch the fight? Yeah, yeah I'll normally uh, fast forward the fight. And this I see a knockdown, then I'll go back and I'll see the knockdown. But I, uh, I always study the corners, uh, even if it's a four-round fight. You know, like I said, there's, there's so many guys that do so many things that are wrong that when I do see them, I'll try to let them know, you know, or if I got them on, on my phone list, I'll send them a message. Just, you know, like one of the things is, is the, the swabs that we have, they come, the sticks are this long, but I cut mine that they're about this long because they're easier to work with. Well, you'll see some of the guys will have that stick about this long and, and it's, it doesn't make sense. So I'll tell them, cut it, it makes it a lot easier. And uh, so putting the swabs in their mouth, you know, like, like this or like this to me it's filthy and i always tell the boxers if your cut man does that get somebody else you know because they just want to look like a cut man and as someone who's traveled all over the world to do this and there are different rules for say nevada versus california versus new york and then i'm sure germany when you were with the klitschko's and all of that do you take advantage uh, of the different rules and um, dependent upon each location you're fighting in and use those to your advantage? Well, you know, that's a very good question. Uh, you know, for the most part, when you have these top international fights, championship fights, they normally go under one umbrella, mm -hmm. all right, which is usually the ABC, Association of Boxing Commissions. And, and all that. So I always follow those guidelines. Yeah, I don't cheat. You know, I uh, I take advantage of opportunities. You know, there was, <laughs> I was doing a, I was doing a fight in California with uh, uh, Chon Cepeda, and and he's he has blood on him, but it's not his. It's the other guys, and and they're giving you the ten second warning to get out, and and he's standing up, and his coach is in my way to get out. But at that point, I'm taking advantage of wiping the additional blood off his back, and. The commissioner's trying to rush me, rush me, and I laugh at him. I said, yeah, you know, you, you got me, you know, but but just taking advantage of those situations. Absolutely. And what countries have you found to have the most uh, differences as far as their, their set of rules go for boxing? Or are they all more or less the same? Yeah, you know, I did a show in Macau. Uh, Chris Algeri fought Manny Pacquiao. Mm -hmm. and the commissioner was from the Philippines and they give us the instructions and what have you not and you can't get the tape and roll it and put it between the fingers and you know kind of like this right uh, you can't do that you know roll it so when they're wrapping Pacquiao's hands Freddie Roach he's twisting it and I asked the commissioner I said you just said that this was illegal you can't do that and he said well this is boxing so I knew it was a very, very weak commission. And uh, yeah, you know, from there you make your own adjustments. Why are certain commissions more lenient? Uh, because they don't understand the game. Good question. Uh, are you sure you're not a reporter, man? No, <laughs> no, yeah, I'm a sociologist. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's, that's, that's excellent questions, man. But yeah, you know, and... I'll mess with these commissioners, inspectors when I'm wrapping hands and all that. Like I say, I don't cheat. I think it's it's stupid. There's no there's no need for you to cheat. And if you're cheating, you're doing something that's not proper for the fighter. Mm -hmm. And uh, but these guys, they're behind me when I'm wrapping hands and they're looking at me like, you know. So I'll put them in check, and I'll ask them. You know, I had one guy in Florida that's right on me, and I said, man, you get closer to me than my wife. <laughs> but then other guys when they 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 question me on the gauze or the tape or the technique. I'll put it back on them because I know the answers. Mm -hmm. And oh, well, oh, that's the way it's in the book. Well, yeah, it's in the book, but you tell me exactly why. And, you know, so I'll put them in positions like that uh, because none, like I say, just like none of us have to be certified, same thing with these commissioners. And a lot of them are appointed by the state. So, uh, yeah, I always try to educate them. 
And as the educator that you are, um, could you tell my audience uh, and readers what types of medications that you use now and what do they do? Uh, have you broken, bro? Yeah, you're in the wrong business. Mm -hmm. I, uh, yeah, that's a good question. And, and, and it's important for people to know. But, you know, I always ask the fighters, also the young fighters, I said, look, when you're looking for a cut man, ask him what the adrenaline chloride 1-1000 does. That's the primary medication that we use. And I'll ask Cutman, and they say, "Well, it's a quiet." Well, the first answer they'll give me is, "Well, it stops the bleeding." I said, "Well, I know it stops the bleeding, but how and why?" Uh, well, it's a coagulant. Well, no, it's not a coagulant. The adrenaline chloride one one thousand that we use on the swab that we put on the cut, it's a vessel constrictor. So you put it on the cut, and as you see, I always squeeze the cut. I take that remaining blood that's in those little vessels out, and then when I put the adrenaline that vessel will absorb more adrenaline and therefore it closes up the blood vessels. So that's what that does. And if the guy tells you it's a coagulant, get another cut man, right? There's a, there's a other medicines that are authorized that I don't use. It's avatine and thrombin. Those are coagulants. Uh, the avatine is like a cotton candy type of texture and you put it on the cut, but once you hit it, it takes the clot off and it continues to bleed. And the same thing with the, uh, the thrombin. It's a liquid thing, but it coagulates the blood. <clears throat> There's a, a new one that we use that's called Quick Aid uh, that's 100% uh, natural, doesn't require prescription. Adrenaline, all these three require prescription. Uh, the Quick Aid does not, it's 100% natural, made out of a seaweed base. So it's a patch. So once you put it on the cut, it dehydrates the blood. Uh, so those are the medications, and that's a good question. And, you know, Cutmen, they should be able to know what these medications do before they get licensed to be a Cutman. Have they banned any medications in the, over the 30 years that you've been in the business? Yeah, good man. Nobody's ever asked that question. Very, very good. I uh, Monset Solution was was a product that they used to use that was a sephoric base. And when I worked with a fighter, Livingstone Bramble, we fought in upstate New York. This one guy ended up with a big old gash. And I'm thinking, oh, yeah, you know, he's going to bleed, bleed, bleed. And next thing you know, he's not bleeding. And, uh, but like a year later, I see him, he comes to Las Vegas to train. And uh, I asked him about that, about the, the cut. He said, man, I had to go to the hospital. And they had to cut that tissue out because Monset Solution is a sephoric base that burns the tissue. So that was their theory. If you put it on the cut, it'll burn the, and it won't bleed no more. But he had to cut that tissue out and then they had to re-sew it. Uh, so that, that was banned. And, and from what I understand in the old days, way before, they used to do stuff like cocaine and chewing tobacco and stuff like that, but I'm not real versed on that. It was too late for me, but uh, Monset Solution for sure. And uh, roughly, was that band, uh, when was that banned? Monset Solution? Yes. Uh, well, I've been, in, I've been in Las Vegas 27 years. I'm going to say they used it then, 25 years ago, maybe. Okay. Yeah. Good um, question. I'll find out on that. Definitely. And Stitch, you have um, your own little compress because you. I remember you said that most at the time of the compresses, they were flat and you yeah. wanted one that was curved and yeah. came out yeah. with your own. Uh, could you tell me about that? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I was coming back from uh, uh, London in the UFC. Kenny Florian and I were sitting together and, and we're water just like you're drinking your water. I'm drinking mine and I'm going like this and if you notice the little water bottles are a little contoured, right? So hold on a second. Let me, uh, let me see here. So anyway, I'm, I'm there and I'm thinking, wow, you know, it makes so much sense because a lot of the swelling comes within these areas that are contoured. And all the end swells at that time, they're all flat because uh, they're created by people who don't know, right? So I went home and I got some clay, made a model and all that. And this is this is the finished product right here. So you can see it. See how it's curved in one. So as you put it, cold direct pressure. And if let's say you have swollen here or here, then you can use the flat side. So now you got two of them, right? And and also educating, if you notice in the old days, you'll see now, even in especially in boxing, the guys will get this and they'll do this with the theory that there's moving this swelling here, but what you're doing is you're moving it into tissue that's not damaged and it comes back and now it gets a little bit bigger. 
So the actual technique is cold, cold, direct pressure. And what you want to do there, Patrick, is the if you want to close up the blood vessels. How many times you got a little cut and you put your, your finger on the cut for a minute, right? Well, blood coagulates itself. So you have to understand that. So if you help it with cold, cold, direct pressure, you're not going to get rid of that swelling, but you can minimize it by it not getting any bigger. So good question on that. So where can people find this and uh, buy, buy one for, them, for themselves? Yeah, you know, I, I have my own line of tape also, Stitch, Stitch Premium Tape and uh, the, the KO Swell and the wrist wrap so you don't put the swabs in your mouth and all that. But uh, Cutman for Higher Supplies carries it. And how I ended up teaming up with him is I was selling my own tape and my own stuff, but I was traveling so much that if you ordered from me, you wouldn't get it till, you know, I came back and packaged it up and sent it and, and just through a dream. I called Juan Ramirez, and, and he's a friend of mine. He had just started his company, right? And I said, well, look, man, would you be interested in selling my tape and my KO swell and, and my wrist wrap? And, of course, you know, it gives him credibility. So I help him out. But, yeah, Cutman for Higher Supplies, they carry everything. The quick aid that you don't require a prescription on, uh, the swabs, uh, everything, the tape, the gauze, everything you need to work a corner and to, to be a trainer. Cutman, he carries it also. You know, I told him my goal is for you to do this full time, and uh, he's doing good. So you got to help people out, Patrick. That's why I'm doing this with you. A absolutely, and as someone who has followed their dreams all their life and has really manifested what they want it to be, do you have any tips for those out there watching that have dr dreams of their own? Yeah, you know, I always say, and I said it yesterday. I was at the Mayweather gym with this young guy, and. He's telling me how hard it is for him. And of course, you know, we all go through those moments, right? But I guess the word of advice that I could give these guys is that one line that we're all scared to cross, if you don't cross it, you'll never get there, right? So make the effort to cross that line. You can always go back. But uh, yeah, yeah, we're all scared to cross that line. I'm sure, you know, in the position that you're in, there's that one moment where should I do it or should I not do it? And you did it and here you are talking to me. And I couldn't be more grateful for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Mr. Duran. It has been a pleasure speaking with you. And I wish you nothing. Well, good luck, man. Let me know how it goes. And like say, uh, I would consider you being a journalist also, man. You did pretty good questions. You, you ask questions that uh, the normal guy wouldn't ask. And uh, so props to you. Thank you so much. And I look forward to running into you at the next fight. All right. All the best. Thanks.